Oh, we do have water. Good. Is this a... Yeah, right. <laughs> is this a microphone? Yeah, I think those are mics probably for the broadcast. Oh, okay, wait a minute. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Man, I'm all tangled up. Mm. Dang him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget these mics are live, so don't say anything about people you don't want to hurt. <laughs> ready? Yeah, whatever. Right. Well, we're about ready to get started. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Seminary Ridge. My name is Pete Mealy. I have the honor of serving as the Executive Director at Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum here on Seminary Ridge. It's great to see some folks that have been with us for programs Throughout the weekend, it's great to see a lot of new faces. And we're really happy that you have joined us this evening. We're also really happy that we have moved this event inside. <laughs> <laughs> it has gotten progressively warmer over the last few hours. And with the threat of rain, we thought we would use this amazing room uh, to uh, have this panel this evening. Uh, this is the seminary refectory. It was built as the dining hall in 1910. Uh, and has been used as, as such ever since, but we are giving it a new purpose this evening as a venue for this event. Uh, this evening we're, we are honored to be joined by uh, Matt Callery from the Addressing Gettysburg podcast, J.D. Hewitt from the History Underground, and Chris Mowry from Logging Through History for Gettysburg, the gateway drug to the Civil War. <laughs> So classic. I know, right? <laughs> we are on a seminary campus. You run into the I know. <laughs> you are on a seminary campus, right? All right, well, I am going to uh, take my lead to the back of the room. Oh. Oh. You have to check yourself. Yeah, check, check the check. <laughs> that what, that's what makes it work, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, enjoy. Good evening, Leah. <laughs> yeah, pass it around. Yeah, just, just share this. All right, cool. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Keller from the Address and Gettysburg podcast. For those of you who don't know, oh yeah, because I think, do you ever get the feeling that the world is a tuxedo and you're a brown pair of shoes? That's kind of how I feel with these guys. <laughs> Not that they're classy in a tuxedo kind of way. But in a brown pair of underwear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Keep it That's Keep it the kind of night it's going to be, I guess. But no, seriously, because I mean, of course, they've got, what, half a million subscribers? What do he, you got? He, he, he does. He I don't have that many. <laughs> what do you have? I just hit 5,000 today. Nice. Right. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The account has been around for 10 years, okay? So <laughs> you guys are doing far better. But I'm not really a YouTube channel. You guys are. Um, and so that's it there. So anyway, we're talking about Get Gettysburg as the gateway drug to the Civil War. And I must admit, uh, that was my title, but I stole it from Scott Harwig who uh, was one of the early guests that we had on the show, and he used it, and I said, damn it, why didn't I come up with that first? Because that was really good, and that's what it is. Um, why, I guess, is one of the things we're gonna try to talk about. Um, and we would like to involve you guys in all of this, too. Um, you know, we don't have a microphone floating around, so maybe if you just shout out whatever it is that you want to share with us, and we'll speak it into the microphone for the camera and all that other stuff. Um, but so, you know, we're all friends here. Relax, have fun, uh, and, uh, and join us. Because quite frankly, we were just talking over there. None of us know what we're going to talk about. So <laughs> we're really leaving it up to you guys. So what I'm going to do is uh, let's go down the line here. We'll start with Chris, since you have so few subscribers on YouTube. <laughs> Chris, why do you think Gettysburg is the gateway drug to the Civil War? Well, I think you know everybody loves to use the, the superlatives about Gettysburg. It was the turning point of the war, which I don't agree with, but that's what they say. Um, it was, you know, everybody talks about it, the bloodiest battle in, in, in the Americas. And, and it's one of the few things that most high school kids are going to learn about when they talk about the Civil War. It's, you know, we talked about this last night. It's like 
Fort Sumter, maybe Bull Run, Gettysburg, mm -hmm. and you know, Appomattox. And so Gettysburg is the one everybody learns about. And uh, it's also right in the center of really kind of the most populous part of the United States. So it's an accessible battlefield. There's yeah. a lot to see here. So I think it just becomes a very natural draw for a lot of people. And it, a lot of people who maybe didn't care about the Civil War, that's what introduces them to it. OK, how about you? Oh, it's OK, yeah. Don't take my mic. For me, um, you know, Gettysburg as, as like a, a, a gateway drug, uh, which by the way, I, I love that, that title uh, and that name. Thanks, Not everybody does. I, I, posted, <laughs> I posted an announcement about this on my YouTube community page. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> somebody replied uh, that that title is so offensive. I mean, yeah, it kind of so, is. I'm honestly, I'm surprised that the seminary agreed to put it out there. <laughs> so, so, Lisa, if you're watching, so you can send you your complaints to Matt at addressinggettysburg.com. <laughs> yes, and I'll forward them along to Scott Hartwig. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, no, but, it, but that's, she does have a good point, though. It is not really the classiest uh, title that we could have used. But we're, we're not the classiest Let's people. Not that uh, <laughs> but uh, for, for me, um, you know, Gettysburg is, is the battle that helped me to understand everything else in, in the Civil War. Uh, once I, I came to Gettysburg, now, now these guys have been at it for much longer than I have. I, I didn't visit this battlefield until much later in life, maybe seven, eight years ago. So, so I, I, I know some people have a story, you know, you know, their dad brought them whenever they were younger and, you know, showed them the battlefield and they kind of grew up, you know, visiting here every year. I, I don't have that story. Uh, but I felt like after I came to Gettysburg and really started to take a, a deep dive into this battle and kind of go on my own quest to, to understand just what happened here, it made all of the other battles of the Civil War easier for me to understand. Yes. It's, it is kind of an easy battle to understand. Like, if you look at the maps and everything, it's north, north and south, east, yeah. west. Like, it's, and the ridges kind of run almost perfectly in that way. And uh, the, the, the troop displacements are along those ridges. It's just, it's easier for me to remember. And then I look at maps of other battles, and it's like, the heck am I looking at here? Yeah. I, so, I think it's uh, a gateway drug, because maybe I can redeem the title here with this. Is, um, but I've, this happened to me. This has happened to countless people that I've spoken to. Um, you come here and something happens to you. Like it's a spiritual thing almost. Something you can't quite put your finger on. And you become obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. it it's a good feeling coming here. And every time you come, you feel recharged. And in, in my case, every time I came here, I felt recharged. And every time I left, I felt depressed. <laughs> Like, I felt like this was my home. I didn't grow up here, but it felt home to me. And it was a, it was a foreign feeling, because home never felt like home. Mm -hmm. And I had a great childhood. It was anything like that. It was just, I hate New Jersey. No offense to people <laughs> in New Jersey. Um, and it just has, no, I, well, it has character. It just doesn't have character I like. I don't like character here. OK, it's, it's a little better here. But anyway, so that got me more interested, you know, I obsessed over Gettysburg for a while, but then after a while that didn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then I was like, well, I gotta learn more about the war. And then by doing the podcast, that's kind of what is happening. Like I'm learning more about the war because I'm starting to, like Gettysburg, just, it's not that it's not doing it for me anymore, but like I, I can't see the forest for the trees mm -hmm. and I have to jump out of it a little bit in order to come back and appreciate it. And, and it's great because, I mean, I, I've been meeting fantastic historians who come on the show and they talk about their books and, and I never really would have sought this information out if I wasn't doing the show, I don't think, you know. So, so what, I'm kind of curious, what, what's your background as far as Gettysburg, like the first time that you were... First time I came here? First time you came here and, and kind of your, your well, experience. And so I always had, um, I have family in Virginia, Warrington. And so, since I was born, we would go and visit them, and uh, visit Manassas, mostly, because it was closer. But we'd go to Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg and places like that. And, uh, you know, I loved, I loved it, but, you know, as a little kid, I didn't really, like, study it or anything. Just, I liked to look at the cannons and the monuments and the uniforms and the pictures of the visitor center and the maps and all that stuff. And, uh, 
it was in high school, I took a military history class. And we watched the movie Gettysburg during the spring semester because our trip in May was going to be to here. So that's the first time I saw the movie. And then we came down and um, watched the movie on the bus. And then I, I'll never forget, I was sitting right up front because I was a nerd and I wanted to really see this, you know. And we, we stopped at the visitor center. We picked up the guide. And then he took us, and it was actually cresting this ridge right here behind us over on Route 30. Um, as we came up, and there in front of me was the McPherson barn, and then the, the mountains in the distance. And I, I can vividly see it to this day, and I can, get, I can feel the tingle in my brain every time I, I talk about it. And something happened to me then, and it was, I was hooked. And I came home. After that trip, and I said, Dad, we have got to go back to Gettysburg. It's nothing like Manassas. <laughs> it's so much cooler. There's so much stuff there. It's like Disney World. So we made, uh, we made reservations that July. We came down for the anniversary. Okay. We had to stay in Greencastle. It took us like three years to realize the anniversary was popular and the reenactment was popular. And so we got sick of staying in Greencastle. So in the fourth year, we're like, let's make plans six months ahead of time instead of three months ahead of time. And then we were able to start staying in town. But I fell in love with it then. And then about eight years later, I moved down here um, to start a bicycle tour company. Because again, I don't like New Jersey. And so this was my way out. And uh, I did that for five years and moved back to New Jersey. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny when we're talking about this idea of a gateway drug. For years, Gettysburg was the only thing in the Civil War I cared about. And yeah. um, you know, to the point where um, I was raised by my grandparents and they both just passed away a few months ago and we were going through some of their stuff and found this beautifully colored and labeled map that I made when I was 13 years old that showed every regiment and Pickett's Charge and where they yeah. went and <laughs> yes. everything. And that's what I was doing. We have video of me at 12 walking around taking notes from all the monuments yeah. from one to the other. Uh, but for a long time, as I finally started studying other battles, it was always through the lens of Gettysburg. So, for example, I'm reading about the wilderness and I see that James Wadsworth is killed at the wilderness and all I'm thinking is, oh yeah, he was a division commander on the first day at the Battle of Gettysburg. Everything in my mind connected back to Gettysburg and that's how I knew those people. You know how 10 rows lead to Gettysburg like a wheel, right? The Battle of Gettysburg is kind of like that yeah. it's like a wheel because everything kind of it's like in the middle of the war everything spins out off of it and you can either go back or you can go forward and find interesting stories about these guys. Matt and I were talking the other day and since we're using all kinds of metaphors and everything like that to describe Gettysburg, um, I, we were talking about this idea that you, you can kind of like trace, you, you can pick any battle in the Civil War and within a, a few people, you can trace it back to Gettysburg. So I, I said it's kind of like the Kevin Bacon of the Civil War. Uh, it's like six degrees separation. Yeah, that's uh, right. So, um, so, I mean, for, for me, uh, last summer, I had a chance to visit uh, Wilson's Creek Battlefield in uh, just outside of Springfield, Missouri. And, I mean, this is a battle that happens very early in the Civil War. And I'm looking at the, the different uh, figures who are involved. And uh, one of them is Franz Siegel. And from studying Gettysburg, you know, I learned about Oliver Otis Howard from the 11th Corps. And I, I'd kind of gone out from that and had read that he had taken over for Siegel. Um, and I am getting that right, am I? Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. Chris is my safety <laughs> net. On this. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes my brain and my mouth don't communicate well, and my brain thinks one thing and stupid things come out of my mouth, so I have to fact check myself every once in a while. Uh, but anyway, it, it, it helped me to understand kind of like this, this line uh, that, that you can trace uh, from one battle to another to where really the, the Civil War, uh, instead of becoming these isolated events, we kind of typically think of things as being in the Eastern Theater, in the Western Theater, in the Trans-Mississippi, and you know the, the Gulf, uh, you know, the, the Gulf states, and stuff like that. Really, it's it's one narrative that takes all of these different branches that that all connect in some way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, <laughs> you know, you reminded me of something, Chris, before um, when you said uh, you talked about the maps that you drew. So. I don't know if anybody listens to this show, I've talked about how I uh, uh, have dealt with depression over the years. In my 30s, I just 
awful. And at the end of my 30s, as I was nearing 40, and uh, really getting sick of the depression, I was going through an old, a box uh, that I had not unpacked in the eight years since I moved back to Jersey. And in it was this little leather-bound notebook that I dubbed the Gettysburg Grail Diary because it looked like uh, the one in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And um, it was just notes that I took from uh, Noah Andre Trudeau's book, Gettysburg, A Testing of Courage. And it was in 2004 when I did it. I arranged like a family trip for my Virginia family and my New Jersey family to come here. And I was going to give them a walking tour of the whole battlefield. I had never walked a foot of the battlefield. <laughs> so I had no idea that it was really, really big. We've only driven around it before. And so we, we were dropped off at the Buford statue and we got as far as the Macmillan house, right down the road here, before we had all depleted our water because we only brought water that big. And um, we were all just dying, right? So <laughs> I realized that wasn't a good idea. But the point is, I had taken notes and I had done this very meticulous notebook and I had copied maps over by hand uh, out of the book, I had drawn the troop positions and everything like that. And I even threw in little jokes, like if there was a pun that I could make or something, and I was, as I was reading it, I was like, I gotta throw that in there just to make myself laugh later or something like that. And I remember reading it, and this is, this is how bad depression is. Like, I was like, who the hell wrote this? I didn't know who that was. And it was only 14 years prior to when I looked through it. And, um, but it was that, and a conversation with my best friend that made me realize I need to be back here because this is the only place I felt happy and at home. And I'll tell you what, I had improved before I moved here, but when I, when, the minute I pulled in the driveway and turned the ignition off at my new place when I first came back, it was like half of my misery went away. It was amazing. <laughs> And, I, and, you know, I don't say this to people so that everybody moves here, because then you're going to ruin it for me. So, <laughs> but keep visiting. <laughs> so what, else, okay, so what, talk, what do you like about Gettysburg so much? Why do you think it is, like, what, what grabs you about it? Uh, there, there are the stories. I mean, first of all, there's the great stories. I mean, there's so many iconic, like, moments. Yeah. Buford out here on day one making the decision to stand and fight. And, you know, the controversy over what happened with the high ground with the second corps and whether Yule should have taken it. And, and some of, you, you know, Lee's decision-making with the attacks on July 2nd. And uh, there's, there's bigger-than-life personalities. There's human interest stories. As a kid, you know, the first story I heard was about Bayard Wilkinson cutting off his own leg out here on July 1st, you know, and I was like, wow, people did that? These guys are hardcore, you know? <laughs> uh, so, you know, you learn things like that, and then you learn about guys like Alonzo Cushing at the angle on July 3rd, just taking shot after shot, but keeping on going, and, um, you know, learning about Pickett's Charge and these guys marching into the face of that, standing in the middle of that field and just knowing instantly it was a bad decision just by looking at it. And I, I just think there's so many great stories. But I think, um, J.D. and I were talking about this earlier, Gettysburg compared to a lot of battlefields is much easier to understand. We were saying that. You can stand on a little round top and understand instantly why that was important. You can stand at Cemetery Ridge and, and imagine the entire fish hook of the Union line. You go to a place like Chickamauga, you can't see 100 yards. You have no idea what's going on in that yeah. battlefield. So I think it's easier for people to connect to because they can understand it all makes sense just like it did to them so before I really knew what Gettysburg was I remember it being it was a very heavy word like I remember the old timers in my family like you know if it was something that was really horrible that happened they'd be like, oh, it was like a Gettysburg you know like it was uh, uh, like just the word that you could use to describe something bad or just whatever, full of carnage or whatever. And so I knew like it was something. And then in fifth grade, we had to learn the Gettysburg Address. And uh, I remember even then, and I really wasn't too you know, keen on anything. Really, I was kind of a dope. <laughs> but like, I remember even then, I was like, I don't understand half of the words here, but it's beautiful. Like it's like, you know, politicians don't 
give beautiful speeches anymore. You know, they just, it's just a bunch of platitudes strung together, but his platitudes meant something. Yeah, it was, it's, it's my favorite speech in the whole wide world. So you have the Gettysburg Address, every school student has to learn it, right? What else? What are, what are some of the other things that make it so big? Either one of you. Uh, I, I think, in addition, I, I would just echo everything that, that, that Chris said, because that's what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> he got the microphone first. Uh, I, I think that, that even so, something that, that kind of continues to pull me back, um, which, my gosh, I'm, I'm about to start having my mail forwarded here. I'm, I'm here so much. Um, I, th I think one thing that, that continues to draw me back is, is there is a culture that has developed mm. around the, the Battle of Gettysburg and I, it, information and, and knowledge seems easier to access uh, about this battle. I mean, if you come to, to Gettysburg, you know, of course, there's the monuments that, that have knowledge and information. There are museums all over the place. Um, you know, there's you know, tons guides. Of books. There's uh, yes, there's there's the guides. I went to now. This is not you know uh, knocking any other battlefield or national military park because I I love them all. Uh -oh. But I went to Shiloh, and I was shocked that there's not much there oh, no, as far yeah. as you know, interpretation of the battle. Well, Gettysburg will spoil you too. It, it yeah. does. If this is like your first, like, not your first battlefield per se, but like the first time you really get into a battlefield, yeah. it'll spoil you. The, the rest the, of it will be very disappointing. The first battlefield I ever went to was uh, Spotsylvania. Okay. Uh, went there with, on, I was you know, part of some tour thing and uh, Gary Gallagher gave, gave a tour. Not bad. Spotsylvania. Uh, the, really, the next one, well, there were a few smaller ones that I went to, but Gettysburg was the next one. And then I started going to all these others, and uh, it, it really made me appreciate this place uh, a lot more and what people have poured into it. Uh, I kind of thought that every major battlefield had licensed battlefield guides. Yeah. Turns out that's not the case. <laughs> no. uh, you're, in, in some ways, you're kind of on your own. Um, yeah. So, so I, I think that's one thing that, that has uh, continued to pull me back is because it's, it's a bottomless well of knowledge and information that, that I can tap into and access. You, you know, you raise a point with the guides. How many of you, just by a show of hands, have taken a tour with a licensed battlefield guide? Only two of you. Okay. No, okay. There's a good deal of you have done that. And would you say that that kind of just sets Gettysburg apart, like, like he's saying, like no other battlefields, uh, not no other, but there's like what, two other battlefields that have some kind of licensed battlefield guide program? A third one now with uh, Brandon Station, yeah. But Franklin does, Antietam, and does Vicksburg? No? I think they just have park rangers. So just park rangers, good. okay. So two or three. Um, and, uh, I, but Gettysburg's though is like the most, like the law was written, you know, what, 100 and, 1915, 13, somewhere around? I, yeah. I'm not aware of any other battlefield that has such a rigorous barrier to yeah. entry yeah. Yes. for being a licensed oh, battlefield yeah. guide. So it's I, easier to get into the CIA, they say. I know. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, you know, and somebody, somebody mentioned Franklin. Man, Battle of Franklin, that, that's one of my favorite battlefields to go to. And the people that have the, the Battle of Franklin Trust do a great job. And, yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. And, and I learned a lot when, when I went there. Uh, the first experience that I had with a licensed battlefield guide uh, here in, in Gettysburg, it, it simultaneously impressed me and destroyed my self-esteem. Uh, because I was like, my gosh, I know nothing about any of this. Yeah, it's, it's very impressive. I know the feeling. I had tried talking to them several times a week. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, we have licensed guides on the show all the time. I don't do a show without somebody who's more qualified than I am, which I'm not, to be telling any of these stories. And, you know, we, we were talking, I was talking with somebody the other day about taking the guide exam, and I, I'm going to take it, but not because I expect to pass. I just want to see how much I need to learn, yeah. right? Like how much I yeah. don't know. And I keep getting in arguments with guides because they're like, no, I can be a great guide. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I got to pass first. <laughs> Just give me an honorary license and I'll be fine. So, you know, so, something I was thinking about with all of that that we're saying, though, there is a catch-22 to how much there is here. 
sometimes it's nice to get to those battlefields that there aren't thousands of people and yes. commercialized stuff everywhere. You know, I love the Shiloh battlefield for exactly those reasons yes. that you can go there and you're the only person there, even at nice times of the year. My favorite experience in all the 20 plus times I've been here to Gettysburg was I was speaking at school over in Hanover and I had a couple of hours, it was in January, and I came over and I went up on Little Round Top. I was the only person on Little Round Top and I had never experienced anything like that before. And I knew that that was nothing what the battle was like, you know, <laughs> off frozen January day, but there was an experience there that you can't typically have at Gettysburg with all the people around and all the commercialization of it. So it works both ways, I think. No, you're right. It, it is, uh, that's why I hate winter as a season, but I love it because everybody's gone. And I kind of get it all to myself again. And it's a great time. You know, you should come here in the winter if you haven't, because if you really want to understand the battle, you, you got to not be blocked by leaves. As much as I love the summer, it's got the leaves. And you can't see anything. So come in the winter time. You can see through things. And if there's like snow that's on the ground, for, we took a tour of Culp's Hill a few years ago. There was crunchy snow on the ground. <clears throat> All the surfaces were fine, you know, there was no snow on them. But it, Culp's Hill finally made sense to me because we're standing there by, I think it was the um, 150th New York, is that right? Yeah, and um, I was able to see through the trees and see snow on Powers Hill. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize it was that close. Like you could see through the trees because the snow was kind of presenting that contrast there. And so it's really a useful tool to come here in the winter. I will tell you though, it's windy as hell and your eyes are going to water and then freeze shut. <laughs> so <laughs> just keep that in mind. <laughs> give yourself four days because you can't spend a whole day out there. You're gonna have to give yourself some time. So I've got a question for you guys. Is there a particular story, like not like a big picture kind of this division attack, this division, is there a particular story from the Battle of Gettysburg that has always really fascinated you or drawn you in? You asking us or that? Yeah, yeah I'm oh, asking oh, you. Oh, I'd like to hear the audience. Yeah. What was the question? <laughs> is there a particular story, I'm not talking like a, like a big picture kind of attack kind of thing, just an individual or some, something that really has always fascinated you about the Battle of Gettysburg? Start with JD. I got too many to go through. <laughs> uh, so, so if we're just doing a stream of consciousness thing, and I'm just picking the first thing that, that comes to mind, uh, the the wheat field is the part of the battlefield that has also always fascinated me the most. It's it's my favorite spot to go to. It's not the most scenic. It's not mm. the most picturesque. You go there and you're in the bottom of a bowl. Uh, but I I love that part of the battlefield. We, we talked about how Gettysburg is easy to understand, but whenever you Except zoom into field. part yeah. of these areas, yeah. it gets a lot more complex. Uh, so, so I kind of like that. The, the, it's easy to understand in some ways, and it's also a Rubik's Cube for me in another. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it's a title, a Rubik's Cube, that's good. Yes, <laughs> we're, we're, lots of metaphors for Gettysburg. <laughs> uh, so as far as a particular story that has always fascinated me. The, the one that really got me comes out of the wheat field, and it's of the soldier who, at the end of the day, is, is lying in the field wounded, and night falls, and uh, all of a sudden the hogs come out mm -hmm. and start eating the dead, and he's having to, to fight these hogs off with bayonets. Yeah. Like, as if this guy has not had a bad enough day already. Uh, now he's got to, to deal with this. So, so that's probably the one that um, has a good one. Yeah, hit, yeah. Me, hit me the hardest when I heard it. Yeah, that's, so that, that is a good one. That, I heard that one later on. I think I love the Buford stuff because I love how things start, mm -hmm. you know, because you know the end. You know all the stuff that happens. But how does it start? It always starts small with one shot, and then next thing you know, it's hell. But I think the thing that got me the most was the cannonade before Pickett's Charge when I was first getting into it. I'm, I'm a very uh, sound, whatever, an audiophile, I think they call it or something. Um, I'm very fascinated with sounds, and particularly the sounds of battle. I don't know why. I've never been in one. I don't want to be in one. But I'm fascinated with that. And 
just the, I can't imagine hundreds of cannon going off for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever it's supposed to be. And uh, what that sounds like, not only in between them, but miles away. And like I just I'm fascinated by that stuff. So that might have been one of the things that got me, you know, that the that they you know that they could hear it in Philadelphia, but they couldn't hear it eight miles away. You know. <laughs> Acoustic shadow. Yeah, Acoustic this shadow. this is my first time being in Gettysburg on an anniversary. Okay. And uh, yesterday was out at the Daniel Lady farm for the, the reenactment out there. And and one thing that that really got me uh, is they're they're doing the they actually were reenacting the, the wheat field. Uh, the artillery is using like a, a fraction of the charge yep. that, that they use in real life. But I'm sitting there on the bleachers and I can feel the concussion from it. Yeah. And, and I can hear what it sounds like. And I was thinking, my gosh, what was it like to, to be there on that day and to feel like the concussion and yeah. just have this constant roar of thunder yeah. uh, going on? It, I've read that yeah. Hollywood gets it wrong because... If there's no discerning somebody screaming in your ear. There's no discerning, you know, uh, a, a cannon from uh, the, the report of a cannon from the explosion of the shell or the muscle. It's just all happening at once, yeah. and it just sounds like white noise or something. Yeah. Like it's just noise. That, and of course, they have all the shells exploding on contact with the ground, which of they did. <laughs> uh, for, for me, I think the story for me was actually one I just learned a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's connected to the 20th Maine, but it's not really like any of the big stuff from the 20th Maine. There was a, there was a guy named George Buck in one of the companies of the 20th Maine who had been a sergeant, and he got demoted over some, like, some petty thing with some officer from another regiment. Uh, and Chamberlain had written about this, and he said, I knew at the first chance I got I was going to give this guy a promotion back to sergeant. And he finds him laying mortally wounded uh, on the slopes of uh, Little Round Top. And he goes over to the guy, and he's writing about this later, and he says, he says, I walked over to the guy, and I told you I promote you to sergeant for faithful service on the Battle of Gettysburg. And he said the guy never said another word. He smiled, and that yeah. was it. Oh, and wow. he said the first thing he did was he, when he found a piece of paper was he wrote out the promotion yeah. and, and made sure that he got promoted, just little things like that. And, and the way Chamberlain writes about it, he talks about him pouring out his manhood uh, you know, with his lifeblood. And you know, Chamberlain's always trying to like really, you know, show how smart he is with that stuff. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, a, it's a beautiful story, yeah. And now that you say that though, I think the, the, the one story that I always come back to is, and it's such a sad end, um, but what service is um, in the 20th Maine, a man, Buster Kilrain. <laughs> um, every time I think, and we don't know where he's buried, but we do know where his armpit is buried, his bloody armpit is buried. And it is, <laughs> it's moving. So, can, let me ask you, oh, go ahead, you got something? No, no, no. Good. You sure? Positive. You we, sure? Wait, we, wow. we, we better give a little disclaimer here for people watching on YouTube. We know Buster Kilgreen didn't really exist. <laughs> <laughs> That's why everybody's laughing. <laughs> Sorry, sir, in the front row. Um, <laughs> Okay, so on, on my show, we've, we've done this twice, and I, I should do it again, but I, I pose a question to our subscribers um, on patreon.com slash address of Gettysburg. <laughs> and, and the question is, why Gettysburg? And most people send in their answers. Um, I used to ask this of the guests, too, when they would come on for the first time. And it was very interesting, you know, if you had a guy who was, uh, say, like a retired colonel, well, uh, the 10 roads lead to, uh, you know, Gettysburg and uh, the army's uh, cave in, you know. And, uh, and the, but when you talk to a historian um, or, you know, well, that's the other people I talk to are historians. And it, it's typically more of a, like a spiritual answer. Um, and the listeners too, they say this too. It's like I said, like it's, you get a feeling, you, you feel like you're home or something like that. So is there anybody in the audience who's brave enough uh, to raise their hand and tell us their why Gettysburg? Um, okay, you sir. Uh, I think it's, for me, it, it's life's perspective. So uh, it's romantic, yeah. but it's not at all. But it is, and when you read the letters from the soldiers, Sent home to the loved ones for the day they know they're going to die. Yeah. And it's so helpful. We're talking about some people that are 
technically illiterate, but they write amazing romantic letters. Yeah. Uh, so the human side of it, uh, how the, the citizens of Gettysburg came together, they didn't want to be part of this, but they, they did the thing, they carried the limbs, they did all these things. It was atrocious, but yet the overtone is a romantic notion of something bigger. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, I know it's a but you, you know, sort of like, you know the, the romance of it draws you in, whether it's the movie or just the way Sam pop Elliot. culture. <laughs> Sam Elliott, yeah. Well, that'll do it. Um, but so that draws you in, and then you start to read more, and and then you read the gory details, like hogs eating <laughs> guys who are laying there wounded in, in the wheat field, and then you can't. Oh, but wait, I'm sorry. And then, but then look at the scenery too. It's beautiful, right? So you get this big hoorah American story. Uh, you know, the Confederacy was stopped here and yada, yada, yada. And you look at this countryside and you're like, man, they couldn't have picked a better place. Like, this is gorgeous. And then you read about the guts and the gore and the swarms of flies and the smells and the bodies. And it's, it's like a horror movie. Sorry, you were going to say. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, he even mentioned so that the characters that are involved are bigger than life. Some of them are just, they're, you know, almost heroic, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't even know how to... Like superhuman. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a cushion. <laughs> Hold his man, but it, while he's trying to command the battery, or the gun that's left, right? Yeah. I couldn't do that. I, if I think, hang now, I couldn't do that. I think it's important to remember that, you know, while all these stories, they seem superhuman and larger than life, these were ordinary men. Yeah. They were farmers and clerks and uh, blacksmiths. I mean, these, these were regular guys that when the war ended, went right back to being regular guys. So, so to me, it's, it's inspiring to, to read those stories because it's, it's ordinary men doing extraordinary things. That's a good point, too. Um, have you read the book uh, by Stephen Evangelista about uh, Brown's Battery, Battery B, First Rhode Island Artillery? It's every chapter is the story of a different member of the battery. I think it's like 38 chapters or something like that. Oh, wow. But each one, it's just these, the story of these guys. I mean, does everybody know the story of the Rhode Island uh, State House, the Gettysburg gun in the Rhode Island State House? No? The, yes, okay. So here's the, real quick the gist of the story is <laughs> day three of the battle, uh, one of the guns is hit by a Confederate projectile, and that dents it, and uh, a round that they were trying to load into it gets stuck, okay? So they got the powder bag in, boom, explosion, dent, trying to get the ball in, can't, okay? And it sits in the Rhode Island State House. So it was the 1960s, I think. They're giving a tour, because it's in the rotunda, or the lobby, or whatever. And uh, they're telling that story, and everybody's like, oh, wow, that's been there since the Battle of Gettysburg. And then somebody goes, um, so does that mean the gunpowder is still in there? It's so like, basically, this is a big bomb, you know saying, right? And so they had to defuse it and everything like that. And so, but the story, that's from Brown's Battery. And the story of these guys, when that round exploded, one of the guys lost half of his head. The other guy lost, like, basically his shoulder. And uh, it's just like, and these were regularly, I mean, you read the story that leads up to this. And it's these irregular guys with kids at home, and they leave to do this because they feel it's their duty. I mean, some of these guys are like 40 years old. They're not like 22-year-olds, you know, and they, but they felt, felt the sense of duty to their country and to their family. Yeah. And then they leave them and die. Some of them survived. They didn't all die, but, you know, the ones that died. That's a great point, too, about, like, families at home and stuff. I think Longstreet had just lost a couple of kids before the Battle of Gettysburg. Wife, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, uh, Sean Vincent's wife was pregnant when he was killed. Uh, his, his baby's buried right next to him in Erie, Pennsylvania. She died like a year later. Um, but a, a story that always fascinated me connected to Gettysburg about just how regular guys these were. You know, Buford was a brigadier general in command of a division at Gettysburg. He gets notification of his promotion to major general on his deathbed in December. And his first reaction when he hears that the president's going to promote him is, really? Does he really mean it? <laughs> and, he, and then he says, now I wish I wasn't dying. Right. And it's just, you know, just something like that. But he was a guy who he's, was he's excited really, about, yeah, yeah, the promotion. But that's yeah. so true. Like, here's this, we think of him as Sam Elliott, you know. 
And of course, people said good things about him too. It's not just Hollywood that made him seem awesome. Um, but you know, and then there he is, kind of almost like boyish, right? And the, really, oh, cool. I wish I wasn't gonna die now. Yeah. Like, you could picture a 13 year old saying that, yep. you know? What were we talking about? Uh, oh, regular people. Uh, so, yeah. uh, does anybody else have a Y Gettysburg? Uh, we have a request from him, by the way. Stop getting the back of his head, Mark. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Uh, so, I'll give away my age here a little bit. When I first came in as a kid, now, this is like in the 60s, so this place was way more commercialized. There were restaurants at the Peach Orchard. There were electric lines. The visitor center was right, right on the battlefield. It's like around. It didn't impress me that much. So now I come back. Now I'm about my 40s. And I think I'm going back in time. The electric lines are down. The place is restored the back the way it yeah. looked. All these commercial buildings on Emmitsburg, I like, heard they're gone and, and more disappeared. But that had a moving experience for me. It's like, I can go back in time to 1863 and, and pretend I'm on that land. And, like, it's just, it's all right. I've seen pictures from back in the 60s yes. when you're talking about it, and, and it shocks me. Because <laughs> it looks like the Vegas Strip. <laughs> it is awful. It's disgusting. Uh, I, I was uh, with my, my sister-in-law and her husband. Um, down around uh, Devil's Den this morning, showing them around. And I told them, yeah, there, there used to be a little trolley that came through here. And I, there was like, a, what was it, an ice cream stand? Or, what, yeah, or yeah, a little gift shop up on... Photography stand down in Devil's Den. Yeah, yeah was there was there? something up on Little Round Top. Oh, Little too. Round Top had a restaurant and supposedly a little uh, and, and brothel they, in the they back. They were like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, there was like a gas station up in the Peach Orchard. I said, it was, I yeah, said, this place Stuckies. was in Texaco. I said, uh, this place was kind of a mess for a while. <laughs> I said, but it, they've done a, a great job, organizations like the American Battlefield Trust and, and others who, who have kind of reclaimed this battlefield and, and like you said, um, you know, helped bring us back to 1863. Yeah, I remember when I started coming here um, a couple years after my first time here, we... <laughs> We, my father and I were staying at the Quality Inn uh, down on Steinware Avenue. And, you know, it's right there on the battlefield. And we're sitting out on our balcony, and we can see up on uh, in Ziegler's Grove area um, all these people congregating. And it's like 6, 7.30, I don't know. It's in the evening. And so we're like, what's going on up there? Let's go see. So we walk up, and just as we get up there, I'm about to ask somebody what's going on, and we hear boom, boom, ba boom. And I look and I see the National Tower buckle and then just go straight down. I was like, oh, what the hell was that? You know, and they're all cheering. And I was like, is that supposed to happen? A terrorist attack. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess what I thought. It was right after 9-11. No, it was right before, I think, actually. It was 2000, 99, 2000. 2000, yeah. And it was, it was crazy. Like, I couldn't believe it. But people cheered because that was an eyesore. But we used that to navigate so we knew that we were getting close to town. And the next year, we drove around for six hours before we got to Iceberg. So we're not, we didn't have GPS back then. So uh, anybody else with a Y Gettysburg? Michael Lentz, and then I'll go to you, sir. I think I'm going to kind of blend the two that have been already answered, which is it's so romantic. A lot of these stories are out there that are so romantic that you can easily really digest. Uh, this is the last real major battle where romanticism has a part to play. Because you get to the battles of 1864 and there is nothing romantic about that. It's just, they're hammering each other until the end, right? And so this is, this right here, these three days are kind of a microcosm of the war themselves. Yeah. In that you have, initially you have the Confederate successful first day. Second day, a little more ambiguous. Third day, complete Union victory. So in a little way, it's kind of a, a kind of a micro symbolism of the entire conflict, and so here at the battlefield, we can take those romantic stories, and we have such a preserved battlefield, we can interact with those stories and see where they were done, and yeah. so we can kind of make that connection in our own mind. What's interesting is that both sides had a part to play in those stories being remembered. You see that in the monumentation now. They wanted us to remember this as a turning point of the conflict. So that's kind of my way of it being a gateway, is because they left it behind for us to interact with it. I feel like I need to swap seats. Yeah, that was good. So are you saying, like, 
Gettysburg is kind of the last of those battles of full of pageantry and you know lines of troop marching as if they're on a parade ground and the yes. banners flying aloft and all that other yes. stuff and then after that we kind of start the ugliness of the way war's been for the last 160 years yeah right yeah and yeah. you start seeing that I never thought of it that way that's yeah. great and good job I think there's something about the fact that it's a three day battle that sometimes we don't really concentrate on just how awful each of those days oh, were yeah. oh, yeah. any one of those days was a horrible oh, wow. battle of itself yeah. they, the, the first core out here just like as a core loses like 60 percent and insane. and just they stood and fought having lost half their men and kept on fighting yeah. and if they hadn't been outflanked Howard and the gang over there hey, hey. I, I, <laughs> I love me some Oliver Howard but spring of 1863 was not his friend um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, just what the First Corps did here, not enough people talk about that. Just what they withstood and kept on fighting um, was, after losing their Corps commander. Compared to the rest of the battle, it was just a skirmish. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, though. It's yes. like, it, it, it's horrific. Any one of these days is just horrific. And, uh, you know, just to look at the casualties of the First and Eleventh Corps, and it's crazy. There's like nothing left of them. And in, in a day, yep. you know, like a work day, almost. Yeah, it's nuts. Anybody, there was another person there, you guys are. For me, I first came here in 2007. I was about 12 years old. Um, and all I had seen was the movie. And then it took until last year in September for me to come back. And really, I was in the area to go to Antietam 160. Um, and I kind of threw Gettysburg on as, yeah, that would be cool, let's go see Gettysburg again. I drove up that road and I was like, no, this is Gettysburg. Like, it, it, there's some just force that, whether it's the movie or the books or people watching it and listening to it, you drive up those hills that you know all the road names of. I'm sitting in a building at the seminary. Like, that is, I am geeking out. This is the coolest thing I could be doing. And, and to have guys like you that, that, that share this, this is why I'm here. Is there are people who like history as much as I do and need to remember what those men did out there because it's that important. And that name, Gettysburg, or Sorry, Chris Get, White will praise me. Gettysburg. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it, it just matters. You go to get it gas, just get a gas. <laughs> <laughs> I think you bring up something else where you, you said that you're kind of geeking out that you're in a building, you know, on the. That wasn't center. even here. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but still, I mean, it's, but it's the property. Yeah. Here, here's something else that, that I think helps to set Gettysburg apart. Is, is there's especially on the first day a lot of urban combat that happens. So a, a lot of battlefields, and, and this is World War One, World War Two, Civil War. Any, it, you go out and it, you're in a field, um, and, and it's woods. There, there are some physical structures here that, that can kind of take you back. Uh, one, one of the, the coolest things. I mean, yeah, like I said, we're here, you know, on Seminary Ridge Museum and you know, the Lutheran Seminary. Um, when I had a chance to go up into the cupola and to, to look at the view that, that Buford had on the first day uh, or, you know, to, to go into town and see where there's bullet strikes in, in, the, in the brick on some of these buildings, uh, there's, there's something about this place that makes it a little bit more tangible as well um, that, that you don't always get in, in other places. I haven't been in the cupola yet. Aww. <laughs> we, we get a big thumbs down from, from Pete back there. Yeah, it, I, I, anybody who uh, you know, comes to Gettysburg, and Gettysburg, um, <laughs> you know, I, I always, you know, they say, where, where do I start, where do I go? I would say, you know, come here first, um, because man, this is where it all started, and, and right here is going to help you. Yeah, th this is going to lay the foundation mm -hmm. for you to understand the, the rest of the battle. Um, there's some people commenting here. Um, 
Buster did exist. I seen him in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Marge Raymond from Brooklyn, New York, says home of the 14th Brooklyn Reg Red Legged Devils, 2nd Brigade, 1st Corps. So she's proud of that. She works at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. And there's a whole bunch of Civil War people buried there. A lot of interesting people buried there. So if you ever are in Brooklyn, stop by Greenwood and ask Marge to take you around. She would love it. Anybody else with Y Gettysburg before we move on? Oh, wow, we got a lot of Paul. Go ahead. Yeah, but it's been a little different than everybody else. Started reenacting, wasn't doing Civil War. And it's just kind of a fluke incident that I ended up in town here, living here. Um, old Army buddy came down, moved down here. And we started coming here, and I just fell in love with the town, fell in love with the people, the yeah. history, and everything was going around. Um, you know, got, a, got a place real quick. But it was living actually <laughs> right down the road here. Um, and it's just, the truck, you know, I hated moving away. Like you. It's like, when you go to New Jersey, you know, you went back yeah. to New Jersey. Yeah. I'm in Massachusetts. I oh. hate this state. It's like, I, I want to come back. And I've been coming, you know, come back here on the World War II weekends and stuff like that. So it's it's it it's just a, it, it's a feeling that you can't put your finger on. Yeah. Yeah, but you just feel great yeah, living here. When I moved back here, I, I started saying to people, I said, I don't know what it is, but something pulls me back there. Like I, I'm miserable when I'm not there. I'm happy when I'm there, and I got to go back and figure out why. And then I realized, um, the day I figure it out. I will probably die in my sleep that night because it's not meant to be shared. It's, it's different for everybody. Uh, even though we all might agree that it's like an intangible spiritual thing that we're talking about, it's still something that um, is personal. And, and if you ever do figure it out, you go, ah, I got it. I can't wait to tell everybody in the morning. You'll be dead by morning. So. Guy. Spent three weeks with Sam Elliott. Great mustache. Great personality. You asked him to do the monologue at least once about thumping their chests. And, oh my God. It was great. The first time he walked down the driveway, I had the biggest brain fart. He's walking down the driveway. I'm going through all the monologues from all the movies. And I'm just like, welcome to the home. So <laughs> 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 everybody he just he smiled at me. Looked yeah, at I'm pretty sure that people don't like when you recited their lines back to him. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there was another hand I saw somewhere. You start back there. Over here. Hey, how you doing? I'm Good. That's, I think it's more. Shout out, please, if you don't mind. Huh? Louder. Okay. I think it's you. You look back at it. You no, have. No. You have. You <laughs> have. <laughs> 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 like I have an ancestor who fought here on day one. People could say, "Oh, it's like the 143rd Pennsylvania." You could actually find your state. Right on the battlefield, yes. and then come back and find ancestors, and so it's kind yeah. of like that. Even Minnesota? It, even Minnesota, right. yeah. Yeah, you're right, now that's a good point too. But you can find that on any battlefield though. All the states were in the war that were there. Yeah, but <laughs> they don't have the Pennsylvania monument if you're, if you're from Pennsylvania. True. Yeah, sure. they have a really big Illinois monument in Vicksburg that's worth checking out. What, and any, I saw some over here. Yeah. there. Uh, Ma'am. Oh, Deb. Deb McCall, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I just um, was born here in 1960. I always wondered what would it be like to be here in 1860. And I grew up not knowing my ancestor, George Sando, was the first soldier killed here. So I want to learn about it. And the events of June 26, I think, are very interesting. Yeah. So Gettysburg, to me, is not just July 1, 2, 3. I had to understand when the rebels first came, and I'm sorry it wasn't romantic. The ladies here in their diaries were scared to death. The armed traders are at our doorstep. They were scared, and African Americans that lived here skedaddled, and some of them never came back. They were running for their lives. It was horrible. There were traders coming here, and they were scared. And the healing that took place after the turning point in the horrible fighting of three days and all the people that were affected by the people in their homes. You can get that experience at the Adams County Historical Society. <laughs> and um, the healing of those words, that two minute speech, yes. and the president coming here in November. Yeah. That's what the next one is. June 26th through November. And all the people coming back to claim their loved ones, to find their sons, to talk to families who care for them. Talk to them in their last hours of life. Those are the stories that. She makes a good point, not to sound like.
like we're plugging the uh, Beyond the Battle Museum too much or anything, but we do tend to shrink get the story of Gettysburg down to July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And we forget this was a town of 2,400 people that suddenly had 50,000 casualties on their hands. This place was never the same after that. It couldn't have been the same after that. No. And then it became a tourist location after that. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good, no, because the, the, they had such damage, the government wasn't going to repay them for all the damage done. So they had to make money somehow, and people were naturally curious from the minute the battle ended, basically, to come and gawk. So, enterprising people yep. did enterprising things, and here we are today. None of us would be here if that first generation weren't like, hey man, I need to make back the money I lost having my farm destroyed, you know? Um, there was a hand down there, I think, sir. Uh, okay, so you, sir, and then you, sir, and then we'll move on to another topic. I'll stand up so I can check that. Thank you. Uh, so, it all started when I was eight years old. Uh, my father brought me out, and I did all the commercials and stuff, right? I did the Vax Museum, uh, the electric map. I did the tower. The tower actually helped me. I like the stand. Yeah, I like the tower. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I grew up. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, came back a couple of times and never really had the, the, the draw. And then, I you know, I'll say, Jamie's videos, the, the, series, the first series he did, where he started taking very, very specific areas of the battle, the Spangler Farm, which I didn't even know existed. Um, Coming up to the you know, Coke, you know, that was awesome. Um, and so we made plans, we literally came out that next summer and we did all those things. We went to the museum, we did the Spangler Farm, we did the Google, we stayed at the Farnsworth House, which was freaky. I was <laughs> stuck, stuck. I was Same else. room. Same room. Same room, oh yeah. It was exactly. freaky. But uh, now it's like, it's like in every, like, every couple of months thing, we gotta go back out of here. Into it now, yeah. so, you know, um, but, so you know, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's it's positive social media. The social media can be so ugly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we were just saying this, like this is a, a, a very beneficial thing that's coming. Like just the knowledge. The knowledge. And, and yeah, the stuff that you guys do in Dressing K for the Battle Day for podcast, Jamie's you know, station, Chris station, like it's just enormous amounts of information that I could never give enough in high school uh, and or college. Uh, well, you could have just had to read a lot of books. Yeah, you could have read a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> going to do that in high school. Yeah, so yeah. I appreciate everything you guys do. And, and, and having an event like this, the event last night was just awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. And then, uh, uh, sir? Uh, why Gatesburg? Um, uh, Personally, for me, it, what I think all of us do is we attach meaning to Gettysburg. And when there's meaning, you understand there's a purpose. I know, uh, personally, I understand you. Uh, it's been 19 years now. Uh, my family was falling apart, and it started with a father-daughter trip to Gettysburg, and we haven't missed in 19 years. And my family now is stronger than ever. And it, the kitschier you get and the sillier you get, the stronger those bonds sure. are. And, and like you said, Lincoln wrote poetry, very eloquent poetry about it, and attached meaning to it. Um, Eisenhower was another figure who found a place here, and there was meaning for him. And I don't know if you were going to include this, but uh, at the dedication of the 20th oh, yeah. May, Chamberlain's... Uh, this I have a video that I put that in that's coming out someday if I bring it on my ass and do it. Uh, I can read it up. Go ahead. He wrote, in great deeds something abides, on great fields something stays. Forms change and pass, bodies disappear, but spirits linger. To consecrate ground for the vision place of souls. And reverent men and women from far, and generations that know us not, and that we know not of, are drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them, shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream, and lo, the shadow of light presence shall wrap them in its bosom, and the power of vision shall pass into their souls. I know we all feel that when you uh, Yeah. And, and, and it's, true, it's true, there's some kind of soul here that draws you to it, and, and, and makes us want to write what he wrote. Yeah. We, we try to say it. No, it's like he's set in the course for the rest of us there, because I think every generation since then, including them, uh, feels that way. 
Not everybody in that's generations, but you know, a good chunk of us do. And whatever purpose you attach, even if it's just to remember something that those men did, or the, the town did, or ancestors did, or you know, just any type of honoring that, it gives purpose to us. That, that's why we love it. The one thing I always wonder, thank you for that, sir. One thing I always wonder is like, there are, what, 10,000 battles in the Civil War? Not all of them as big as Gettysburg, of course. Every one of them had these stories of yeah. valor and yeah. horror. Why this? Part, part of it's propaganda, let's face it, because <laughs> it's the first major battle that's a significant Union victory in the East. Sure. Uh, because if it wasn't about that, people would talk about Vicksburg a lot more. Because, I mean, I'll probably be in the minority, and this is the wrong place to say it, but I think Vicksburg <laughs> mattered more than Gettysburg did. So I think about it. Um, yeah, one person. <laughs> yeah, one person. <laughs> but, but it was. It was something that the North needed to be in the press. We beat Robert E. Lee, and we beat him big time. Yeah. Uh, so it, they, that was going to get sold, and that was going to get reproduced in the newspapers. And that became, I mean, whether it was the turning point or not, it felt like the turning point for people. Uh, so I think from Can then you on. Say it's a turning point. Absolutely, it's a turning, turning point. point. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll give you that. Thank you. Yeah. Because there's more than one turning point yeah. throughout the entire war, not just. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. How about pop culture, though? It, of course, the movie, but prior to the movie, I mean, it's mentioned in tons of old films, westerns. If, you know, westerns, if it's like an old cavalry movie or something that takes place in the west afterwards, uh, you know, if they're talking, if they're old veterans, you know, like John Wayne and Victor McLaughlin or something, they're like, oh yeah, back in, at Gettysburg, you know, I was with the 10th or, you know, something like that. And, uh, it, like, it, it's just, it finds its way into things, even things that aren't about the Civil War or aren't about Gettysburg. Yeah, you know, and I was just thinking in terms of politics even, uh, you know, uh, Rufus Dawes leads the um, Wisconsin troops across the field to the railroad cut. His son becomes vice president of the United States. Yeah. There's a private buried over in the cemetery whose great grandson became president of the United yeah. States. Yeah. And so those guys even had connections to modern generations that connected back to Gettysburg that I don't know if those exist in a lot of other places. There's a, a heavy metal band that that did like a whole album called yeah. Gettysburg or something like that? They're called Civil What's War, it? yeah. Civil War is the name of the band, yeah. So the name of the band is Civil War? Yeah. It's a stupid name for the band. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so, just kidding, Civil War. <laughs> Please don't hurt me. No, but so they did, but it's like a heavy metal, and people have sent it to me uh, all along. I can't, I'm not into heavy metal. I just can't go through with like one measure of the song. So, but. Uh, I mean, it's even gotten into that, and I don't know, I don't know, it's just, to me, I don't put Civil War history with heavy metal, uh, maybe bluegrass music with the Civil War, you know, our modern country, but not heavy metal. Death metal of all the types of metal, too. So that, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. And then now, of course, you know, there's two Gettysburg podcasts, and then you interlopers keep coming in here. And, <laughs> overshadowing us. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, like, it's just, people are just obsessed with it. And, and people that don't even really study history, they just say, oh, I've heard of Gettysburg, I loved it. I've met so many people that had to pee while driving on Route 15, and they stopped at the sheets down on 97, and they saw signs for Gettysburg Visitor Center this way, and they're like, oh, I might as well stop and see what it's like. And they're expecting, I actually had one woman tell me this. She goes, so we, we're just kind of passing through, and I just want to take a quick little drive around. Where's the entrance? And I go, there's no entrance. She's like, what do you mean there's no entrance? I go, it's, it's like six miles or whatever from north to south, and four or five from east to west. To, it's like 29 miles of road. It's very porous. There is no entrance. And she's like, really? I said, yeah. She's like, well, I hear battlefield. I picture like a football field. And I was like, well, no, this is the furthest thing from that. It's funny because I had the opposite recently. I had some friends of my wife who are coming here in a couple weeks, and they hadn't been here. And, and she's asking me what the places are to go, and I'm giving her some sites. And she's like, can we get from one to the other in the same day? <laughs> I'm like, you can walk and get from one to the other in plenty of time. Yeah. Like, I think she was thinking it was it's way like a sink for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, what, anything else you want to throw in? 
I'm hungry. What? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. I'm Good night. <laughs> no, so uh, I guess do you have any questions, questions or anything like that? Um, JD is here. Over there. Over yes, there. sir. Brian. Uh, first of all, Chris, I want to let you know that I'm here 368,000 at one. I don't know how. Thank you. I don't know how I've the algorithm never offered you that. I mean, it, just, it makes no sense. And that's one of the things about YouTube. You just, you know, you can go years and all of a sudden you discover a channel. It's like, wow, how did I not find this sooner? Not that I'm saying I'm one of those channels, but there's a lot of channels like that. Yeah. yeah. So, my question is this. Um, I've asked this a lot of my friends. It's 2 o'clock on July the 3rd, and there's 12,000 men about to come across the field. Where are you standing? Are you going to the Yes, <laughs> Anywhere but here. No. What, what do you see when you look at the biggest charge? What do you see? I mean, the, with the benefit of hindsight, I see failure. But if I'm Robert E. Lee in that moment, no, no, yeah. I'm you. Where do you see yourself? Oh, where I see myself? You're a little boy. Yeah. And you're gonna go. You're you're somewhere there. Where are you? Are you on the side of the way? Are you? At the I'm at the Eighth Ohio, getting ready to flank those guys as they come about. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, seriously. I mean, I. Sure as heck, rather be on the Union side behind a stone wall in that case with canister fire raining down on those guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a reason those Union soldiers after it was over were chanting Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg at those guys because they had been on the other end of those exact things, marching on Maurice Heights and, you know, uh, those things. Uh, so yeah, I, I, that's where I'd want to be. I'd want to be on one of those flanks where nobody's coming at you, but you're pouring fire into the enemy and you're having a major impact. People forget that, the Vermont guys on the uh, south end, the 8th Ohio on the north end, that was devastating to those guys marching across that field. Not just the artillery, not just the guys in front. But yeah, and thank you for subscribing, by the way. <laughs> what about you, what was your address in that name? I'd be in Missouri. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there's a, an interesting story, and, and I'm, I'm going to be paraphrasing it because I can't remember the exact de details. Lynn's might be able to help me out once he hears it. Uh, but there's a, a story of a father and son in the middle of town. And it, do you remember what street it's on? It's not important to the story. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> it's, but uh, the, the story is this, this father, this candidate starts, and this father tells his son, we're, we're going up oh. to the roof to take a look at this because this is – this is something that we are never going to see again. Um, and and I, I always see myself in that story uh, where uh, there, there's a bunch of chaos going on around me um, and there's, there's probably a little bit of danger, but Dad Gum, I want to see it mm. because you're, you're not going to see anything like this again. That's a great one. That's a great answer. Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm also on the flank, probably not going to get hit. <laughs> 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 yeah, that is good. All right, another one? Mike, so cheesy. Let's limit it to one. <laughs> um, you're deep into the Gaysburg story. And of course we know all those popular stories, but what is one story about Gaysburg you think needs to be given more coverage? Called Hill. Amen. What was it like? A fifth of all the, all the rounds that were fired during the entire battle were at Culp's Hill? Uh, it's, Most number it, of hours fought. Over yeah, the every day there's over. major action happening yeah. there. I think the fact that Little Round Top's closed has given it some love because people are forced to go somewhere else. But mm -hmm. I want to do a whole series on Culp's Hill on my channel at some point because there's so much. George Sears Green is like one of the perfect people to tell a story about. <laughs> He's cool. I mean, he is a cool dude. Oldest general on the battlefield. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, Culp's Hill. Pretty sweet mustache, too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, I saw another hand somewhere uh, in the back there, sir. I just want to thank you guys for bringing this, the time you put into this stuff. I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm just trying to say how proud I am of you guys and how much you guys have given to the community. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Parsippany? What, you want to start a fight? <laughs> You're like, where, where? <laughs> where, why, where are you from? South Lakeville. South Lakeville. That's Central Group, right? Which is really a thing. <laughs> what? Friends of Mom and Dad. Oh, nice. Do you know David Martin? Oh, yeah, okay. We interviewed him a couple times. See, those of you who haven't listened to Addressing Gettysburg on Patreon are really missing out on some fun interviews with some wonderful people. Uh, all right. And then, <laughs> Another question? Someone? Yeah. Uh, this is just something I wonder whenever I come here. We always talk about like, oh, the fighting in the streets of the town of Gettysburg. Why would you fight in the streets when you have all this open space around you? Well, well would you fight in the streets? Yeah. Because well, you're retreating break? through them and... <laughs> yeah, but well, like, why, why in the streets when you go out in the woods around well, they were retreat. So here, they were retreating. The Union Army was retreating through the town, and those who could would form some kind of a defense to slow the Confederates. They're not trying to hold the town; they're just trying to slow the Confederates so that whoever can get away can get away to safety on Cemetery Hill. So they are trying to get to the woods, to the hills outside of town. But you gotta, you gotta give people room to breathe. So they're fighting delaying actions, and, and it's not organized, it's a rout. Like, you know, there's some that are retreating in order, but for the most part, they're all just like, you know, feet don't fail me now, and they're like, gone. So, yeah, they, it's not that they're saying, we must fight in the streets, we're going to fight in the streets. Yeah, the, the town's not the objective. Right. Um, it's just there. It, it's, it's just, there. it's in yeah. the way of the objectives. So, so they have to get through there to get to what they want or, or defend what they want to defend. Yeah. Or, or it, does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's like chaos too, because yeah. a lot of the, a lot of the guys, like the first corps guys, a lot of them didn't come through the town. The, like, uh, what's, uh, I'm drawing a blank. No, no, no. The, 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 the first division that came on the field. Wadsworth. 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 Thank you. Um, you know, they cut across fields and yeah. they didn't come through the town, but they're retreating through the town and they're like, where are we? You know, I have no idea where I am. We didn't go this way. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just going to say, we went to David Wilson's house today and they had that diorama of what the town looked like. Yeah. Like, Holy crap, like, you know, like, looking at the town now, uh, you know, okay. imagine, like, it doesn't really seem like it's all that confusing, but there's all these back alleys and fenced in areas and yes. it's like, how the hell these guys get from one end to the other when you said they never actually went through the town to get there? Right. To their objective. So they're pushing back in front of figure out it's panic, you know? Like, yeah. Like, get out of here. It's a mess. Yeah. And the Confederate, it's not like the Confederates are like several miles away and we've got time. Like they're right on your heels. In yeah, and cases. like, well, well the, the remnants of the First Corps were like right out these windows, yeah. basically, yeah. right here. They were right on the edge of town when they finally had to break and, and go. So they were already in town. They came in here to get something to eat, too. <laughs> <laughs> they were disappointed because it wasn't built yet. <laughs> There's another question. I saw another hand go up over there. I think of yes, It's not that. I, I'll give two answers, because I'll tell you, whenever I come here, my wife, who doesn't care for history, insists I take her cheesecake from the Lincoln Diner. I always have to take some home, and she will give me a hard time if I say this and then don't remember to do it tomorrow. Um, but for food, um, I've actually really been enjoying the hoof fin and fowl. Very good. Yeah. Delicious. Especially because Eric Dorr always pays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's even more delicious when Eric Dorr pays. Yeah. What's your favorite? What do you get when you go there? The New York strip. The strip? The, the steak. With yeah, because I don't eat seafood. That's horrible. That's, you don't eat seafood? I don't eat anything that looks like it did when it was alive. So. <laughs> well, you're missing out. You're missing out. Oh, my God. Uh, so, uh, the, for, for something really, really nice, I really like the Dobbin House. Uh, I also will echo hoof, fin, and fowl, uh, eat there quite a bit, um, and then also uh, Getty's Burger. I'm a big fan of Getty's Burger, um, so I, I always try and eat there when I can. And their sweet tea is exceptional. 
Um, there, there was one time I went there during the summer and it was really hot and I was sat down to order and she said, what do you want to drink? And I said, I want all of the sweet tea that you have. <laughs> so she brought me a, uh, a cup and I said, I'm sorry. I want all of it. <laughs> she like literally <laughs> brought out and, it. Yeah. <laughs> and brought it out. And uh, yeah, but anyway, yeah, th those, those are my favorites. Wait, as soon as you said that, all I could think of was, I'm afraid what you think I said was, bring me a lot of sweet tea. <laughs> what I said was, bring me all of the sweet tea you have. <laughs> I'll answer your question after the show. Because I, I don't want to say. He has to live here. I have to live here. <laughs> And I do business with some of the restaurants, so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, you know. But I got some great answers for you. Yes, sir. I, I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, as you said that your wife isn't a fan of history. Um, to the worst? I, I, last night, we spent our 23rd anniversary here with you guys, and um, pretty much all of our anniversaries have been spent here at Gettysburg. Um, my wife wrote to me in coming to Gettysburg because my only real, um, reference to the Civil War was Chancellorsville Battlefield. I, I live probably about 15 miles from there. And uh, she got me to come up here because it's the halfway point between our house and my in-laws. <laughs> so she's like, hey, we'll stop in Gettysburg, check it out, you know? And for her, we walked around these battlefields and it was just, it was pure torture for her to walk around these battlefields. But JD, your series last year on Gettysburg, Chris, JD, you've become household names in my house. And, um, you know, just watching that, she's been educated on it now. So now she's like, oh, we need to go check this out and stuff like that. So it's been. You make a great point. We talked about this last night at the other one we did. A lot of people don't like history because nobody's ever made it interesting to them. Yes. And for a lot of us, our gateway to history was a good teacher or somebody that, you know, brought it to us. Uh, so for my wife, who she, she doesn't really care about history, but I'll, I'll find her watching my videos. Uh, she likes her face. I think she, well, I, I think she likes YouTube me more than she likes real me. <laughs> so, but like, like some, you know, some of the things, the stories that I tell, she finds those interesting, even though she'd probably never intentionally come to Gettysburg and do a tour. Um, so it really does come down to how you tell the story, how you present it, I think. When I started addressing Gettysburg, I, you know, had t-shirts and stuff that I made, and I wasn't very good at it, and so I would just throw random things up on, on a t-shirt and try to sell it, and the first thing I did at an attempt at a slogan was, are there any teachers in the room? Okay. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry in advance. Uh, the slogan was, history is not boring your teachers were. Because, I know, but, but I got complaints. Teachers didn't, they're like, I'm a teacher and I don't appreciate that. And it's like, because you're, well, you're one of the boring yeah. teachers, yeah. <laughs> but I took it down because uh, I was trying to, you know, make friends uh, and not enemies when I started out. But it, it's kind of like what you said. It's, I had three, uh, yeah, three good history teachers in my life that really got to me. And, and that's the beauty of YouTube and everything now is that you just get regular people who just have an interest in it and have a knack for communicating or have a knack for video making or acting like an idiot. And we somehow connect with people and, and people are like, yeah, this is easy. And, this and you is can fun. pick your teacher now because if you don't like my channel, maybe you like JD's, yeah. maybe you like somebody else's. You can find somebody you do connect with. I like Mr. Richard Martin. Martin. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just busting. Uh, there was another, uh, wait, let's see, over here. Did anybody over here? Yes, sir. So, I thought you were here for a second. Hey! So we talked we, we talked a little bit about how media affects things and how stories are told, um, especially here with who saved Little Round Top, Governor K. Warren, to Joshua Chamberlain, and how the movie impacted that. So how do you all try to balance the actual history versus that mainstream kind of point of view of what what gets presented to the world um, through that media? So for me personally, what I, what I try and do with the, the content that I produce is, is maybe take some of those familiar stories um, that, that everybody can connect to 
and, and use that as an anchor point and maybe tell, kind of retell that story, maybe show it from a different angle, maybe throw in some of my pretentious uh, slow motion shots, uh, you know, or something like that. Uh, and then say, oh, okay, so, so here's, here's what you know. Here's something that maybe you didn't know. Yeah. And, and maybe kind of hit this from a, a different angle and, and maybe show people something that, uh, you know, maybe a, a little bit more obscure. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 I, I was thinking the exact same thing, you know. Let me tell you, you know, you know the story of the 20th Maine. Do you know the story of Patty O'Rourke, whose unit you know, was right next to them, you know, right down the road on the, another part of the hill? Let me tell you about them. Because or David Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, or the first Minnesota. I mean, us Gettys nerds know first Minnesota, but the average history person doesn't really know much about the first Minnesota. Calvin Coolidge called them the saviors of the country. Not the 20th Maine, the first Minnesota. Uh, and you know that's every bit as much a story, but yeah, I agree 100%. Start with what people know and then connect to something else. I think that's a perfect way to do it. Yeah, Tim Smith said that when he was a kid, it was the first Minnesota that was the big deal regiment, not the 20th Maine. And then the Killer Angels came out and then the movie and it's been downhill ever since. Um, uh, to answer your question, uh, I love when I hear someone say something that it, I, like indicates that they, that they only know the movie. And it's typically, <sighs> Longstreet, if he had just let her go around the ride, <laughs> my God, things would have been so different. And I was like, no, yeah, well, it would have been different, but there wouldn't have been a Confederate victory. It might have been a worse defeat, because they would have been swallowed up. And, well, what do you mean? Why do you say that? Well, because behind the stupid round tops, there, there were, you know, the 5th Corps, the 6th Corps was coming up, the 12th Corps is on its way over from the, they had too many troops there that would have swallowed up those guys. And, um, and then they're like, you could just see it in their eyes that something happened in their brain and now they're like really interested to find out, well, what else doesn't the movie tell me? Which is a lot, because <laughs> it's only a four hour movie. Or four hours and 88 minutes if it's a... <laughs> director's cut but uh, yeah so but you gotta be you can't be I know I just gave a little attitude there but that was shtick you can't be that way you have to be you know because we were all there we all thought I thought the movie was you know because yeah. in the featurette they're always like you know accuracy we're, we're, we're so important or it's so important to have accurate you know so I'm like oh well this is accurate so nothing is wrong well, the, the problem movie. is I think so much of history has been taught as black and white you know we, we push the narrative of the turning point of the war as though if the South had won at Gettysburg, somehow they win the war. Yeah. No, and yeah. that was just not going to happen. There were tens of thousands of Pennsylvania militia that were descending on this position. They were going to be down a third of their army. Uh, the Confederates are going to be outnumbered three or four to one within a week or two. They, they were not winning this war without help from Europe. But we love the black and white. This changed everything narrative. My, my question is, though, like when some of these people say that with some like sense of lament in their voice, yeah. it's like, why do you want the South to, like, you, don't you love your country? Like, why? And they do, or they claim to, or their bumper sticker says so. But like, but they want the South, they wish that the South had won, and I don't understand that at all. But you know what? No, I take that back. I do, because when I saw the movie, this is the problem with the lost cause. It gets into everything. Even in the history books in, in North Jersey, there was lost cause crap. And I thought the Civil War was simply a disagreement among a national family, right? And we just couldn't agree and we couldn't compromise, so we had to, you know, go to blows. Yeah, and I think a lot of people want it to be that now. Yeah. I, I deal with that all the time on, on the channel with people who just so desperately want the war to have been about anything for the South other than slavery. I just had an and, I, and I understand, listen, it's not black and white, it's nuanced. What South Carolina seceded over is not why the Tennessee farmer enlisted. Right. You know, that's all wars though. Um, but it, there does seem to be a group of people who so desperately want slavery to have not been an issue in that war. I don't know why. I, 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 well, because it's embarrassing, that's why. Like, you, you, you have an ancestor who fought for that side, and we all agree now that it's wrong to own people. And so, but you're proud that your ancestor fought for whatever 
the regiment he fought for from the South. And you can't reconcile that. And, and, and also people, the average Joe doesn't understand that there's nuance there. And you can be proud of your Confederate soldier great grandpappy and also think owning people is reprehensible. And, uh, but the, the, the mainstream of society does not allow that now. So if you're, if, if you're proud of your Confederate grandfather, then that means you're a racist today. And, and nobody wants that. So it's a very messy thing, as is anything with history and life and anything else. Anybody else? No, everybody's hungry and ready for bed. One more, <laughs> and then we'll go. Individually, what is your favorite weapon used throughout the entire course of the war? Favorite weapon used throughout the entire course of the war? Oh, the artillery is just so badass. Uh, but I mean, if I if I were in the service, you know, I'd want to be an officer so I can carry a pistol. I don't want one shot. I want you know six shots or five. They have five or six of those. Yeah. I, mine's completely no, nothing to do with the weapon itself and everything to do with my family. My I'm writing a book on the 20th Ohio Infantry. They carried Harper's Ferry 1855s. I want one desperately. They're impossible to find and they're super expensive when you do. But that's the one for me. Yeah, I, I'd probably say the one that you mentioned, the 1861 Springfield, just cause, because to, to me that represents the, the Civil War soldier. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's honestly on my list of uh, firearms to add to my collections. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for not falling asleep. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Peter the man here at the Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. If you, if you haven't been up into the museum and up into the cupola, you've really got to let yourself uh, and treat yourself because you'll love it. It's absolutely awesome. Yeah, treat yourself. Uh, we, we have a, another full day of programming tomorrow. We have schedules in the back. We have tours going starting at... 915. Uh, Scott Mingus is going to be here giving a lecture. Joe Owen uh, we're going all the way until 5 o'clock, so please pick up the schedule. And the museum will be open from 9 to 5 with cupola tours starting also at 915. So if you want to see the view where it all began, uh, we hope you'll come up. So thanks so much for being here this evening. We're really great with this. Uh, uh, I'm really happy to have this great panel here and a really great audience. Cody and I were sitting in the back looking at each other going, man, those are some good questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.